Good morning. What a refreshing way to be able to start the morning is to remember what Christ has done for us. It's, a, it's an awesome, awesome thing, what the Lord has done. Well, we're back in the book of Genesis today. We're entering chapter 6, and it starts out rather spooky. Everybody go, ooh, ooh. It does. It starts out a little spooky, and so we're going to go into some uh, waters in which nobody's really exactly and totally sure of exactly what happened here. But we're going to talk about it, and this is the entrance to God's judgment upon the people in the book of Genesis. So as we get started, I'm going to go over what we went over last week, which was we noticed that there were two trees, definitely two family trees. If you remember previously, we talked about the line that, that went through Cain, and we saw how their names we're trying to blot the name of God out and that sort of thing. And so you see this real rebellious family tree might resemble your own, kind of like mine. And then you see the family tree of Seth and all the various people that were in that family. And it's an interesting thing to, thing to consider these two trees. We looked at the significance of the names of all the people in the line of Seth. And as they went down, what they meant, uh, Adam being man, Seth meaning appointed Enosh, meaning mortal, and uh, just remembering that we ourselves have an expiration date, every one of us. I don't know if, I don't know if it's stamped on the bottom of your foot or not, but uh, we all have an expiration date. We looked at Enosh, Kenan, Mahalel, and Jared, and how they all died, just exactly like God said, the day that you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. Spiritually, there was separation immediately, but eventually there was physical death that was brought into the earth because of what mankind had done in rebellion against God. So we looked at all of the various names as we went through, and uh, if, uh, if you didn't see it, you can pull it up. Everything we have is online, uh, GBFMC. Um, you, you can take a look at it and look at it. So we looked at Methuselah, which means his death shall bring which is rather significant. We see that the year that Methuselah died, the flood came. It's an interesting, it's a coincidence that he has the longest life of anybody in the Bible, 969 years, which is a testimony to God's grace, isn't it? That he waited and this person having the longest possible life was God waiting as long as he possibly could until he brought judgment. So we, we looked at that, and it's a testimony to God's grace. Looking at all of the various names in the two family trees next to each other, you can see the difference. And then we know that Noah is coming, and everyone who's been to Sunday school knows who Noah is and what happened, other than, of course, our own Noah who comes here. He's completely different. And we looked at the genealogy and how it spells out the gospel, even in the book of Genesis in chapter 5, that every one of the meanings of all of their names in the righteous line of Seth, man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching and his death shall bring the despairing rest. Every single one of those names has a purpose in God's plan. And you know, when you're naming your kids, nobody thinks through, well, how does this fit into my tree and does it make a sentence? Only God can do things like that. So now we're going to get into chapter six, where it begins the flood. We have this introduction. <coughs> Excuse me. It says in verse five, chapter six, and the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. As we jump in, please pray with me. Fathers, we look at this passage, this sacred event, Lord, that you brought about. I pray that you'd help us to look and to learn from it. I know, Lord, this was a literal event that truly, truly happened. And I know it was done as a lesson to us as well, not just for them, but for us. I pray that you help us, Lord, to see new and wonderful things in your word and that our hearts might come into alignment with your will. So guide us now, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. 
It begins in verse 1. Now it came to pass when the men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the, ends of, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. This is the introduction to what God did. And it begins that there began to be people who proliferated the earth. There are some experts that say there may have been as many as seven and a half to eight billion people on the earth at this time. When you consider the long lives and the incredible virility of the people in which God created from the beginning, you think about how many children they could have had. If I was 969 years old, and you're gonna notice Noah, he waits for a while. He, he doesn't wanna to start too early having children. He waits till he's 500 years old. Apparently not wanting to bring children into this evil world. He waited, and then he had three. But there, there could have been between seven and a half and eight billion people on the planet at this time, which is not so far away from where we're at today. It says that when they began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, meaning men, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Now, there are three possible explanations which many scholars and Bible teachers will cite. Some people believe that the line of Shem began to integrate with the line of Cain. And yet the line of Cain would also be not the sons of God. And Seth, they're not the sons of God either. It's said that some of them may have been royals or they may have wanted to be rulers of the time and they wanted to gather to themselves women and create a harem, which the text does not support. And yet there are people who presuppose that that may be it. I have another theory. When it says sons of God, it means ben, which means son, Elohim, which means sons of God. That's exactly what it means. Everywhere where sons of God is used in the Old Testament, and there are four other explanations, they are angels. They are created first person by God. They're not second, third, fourth generation like all of the sons of men would be who were born in the image of their predecessor. And yet there are others who are called the son of God as well. Two in the New Testament. One is Adam. He was directly formed by God. And so he's called a son of God. And also Jesus, the son of God. All of which are first person created by God, not descendants of man. And so if we understand that, 
the scripture teaches that the sons of God came down and integrated with the daughters of men and created offspring. And your question might be, what? Well, it's not too far a cry when you look at all of the legends and you look at all of the things that come out of the Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians and you have the gods coming down and mixing with men and creating other gods, we call them demigods. These legends have roots in reality right here in the scriptures. It's a scary thing to think and you wonder why in the world would such a thing happen? Well, we'll talk about this. So, essentially, those who are the sons of God are those who are a direct creation of God. These are fallen angels. And some of you may not believe that. So I'd like to show you some scriptures because the best commentary on the scripture is the scriptures, absolutely. Because you'll find commentaries and teachers to tell you anything in the whole world. Just go on YouTube. They must be right. They're on YouTube. In John 1, 12, it says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. You know who that's talking of? You and me. Because when we are born again, we are a direct creation of God. You are no longer in debt to your family tree. Praise God for that. I don't have to be a slave to sin like my parents. I've been set free and I've been born again of above, not of any the will of man, but the will of God. So you too are a direct creation of God if you've come to Christ and have been born again and been given a new heart and a new mind. You too can be a son of God. Romans 8, 14 says, as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Just to give you a little extra proof in Galatians 3, 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Notice, not everyone that has been created is a son of God. And yet, if you are a direct creation of God, recreation of God, then you, having been born again, then you are also called a son of God. So what is the problem with angels coming down and procreating with human beings? Sounds like a good hybrid. If I were breeding dogs, it might sound like a good idea. Genesis 1.21 says, God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, that which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And remember, he brought all of the animals to Adam to see what he would choose, what he would name them. And he named them all, except there was not found a compatible helper for him. God showed him the problem before he brought about the solution. And he said, there's nobody like me. There's nobody according to my kind. And you see, that's the, the problem that we have is we, we don't like necessarily to be pigeonholed into a certain kind that God says that we're supposed to be with. Well, there were angels who rebelled and decided they would come down into the human race and pick whomsoever they wished. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Do you see how that might be a problem? That's the problem they have here in Genesis. You have fallen angels coming down and mixing with those who should not be mixed. And the scripture says to be yoked together with an unbeliever means what are, what's going to happen when you have a child? What's going to happen when you decide to train up your children? And one says, well, I submit to the word of God and I'm going to show discipline. And the other one says, oh no, that's child abuse. You got a problem. Unless you have two people that have submitted to the word of God and God is the king over that relationship. Even then, it's tough. All right, I got some amens in the room. Okay. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship does righteousness and lawlessness and what communion has light and darkness. And God is saying this for our benefit because those kinds are not to mix. In Jude, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, alludes to this period of time before the flood. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but they left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness and judgment of the great day. 
and as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Those who came and fell, these fallen angels who came and procreated with human beings, God has them in chains. They're not wandering around anymore. You got a demon problem, it's not one of them. Also in 2 Peter 2 verses 4 and 5, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, by the way, that word hell is several things into English. This particular one, it's the only time that the Bible uses the word Tartarus. It is a unique place and it is the only time that this word is used in the scripture so that you know. They're not in, the, they're not in jail, they're in prison. And if you have a classical education, you know Tartarus is even below hell, but anyway. But cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains and darkness to be reserved for judgment. And he did not spare the ancient world, but he saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood on the world of the ungodly. So you see they're mentioned just before Noah in line, in a, in a, in a timeline. So that's why I believe the scripture teaches that these were fallen angels that came to earth. Matthew 22, the Sadducees came to Jesus and they tried to stump him, which is funny. They tried to stump Jesus by asking him a question. There was a woman, she got married, her husband died. They had no children. And so what you do is you have the next in line marry her. And there were seven brothers and all seven of them married this woman and there were no children. When they get to heaven, whose wife will she be? And Jesus says, your problem is you don't believe in the resurrection and you don't believe in the power of God and you have no faith, number one. And that's why they asked the question that they did, not because they wanted an answer. You know, there are some people that ask questions don't really want an answer. They already have an answer for you. They're creating a creative way to be able to tell you something, which is okay. Jesus says in Matthew 22, speaking of angels, Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. I want you to note that the angels in heaven don't marry. But fallen angels have done things that are unspeakable and should not be done. Now, how do you do that? How do you sexualize an angel? Well, I know all of the angels have male names, which is not a coincidence. Now, how does an angel become sexualized to be able to procreate with a human being? I don't know, but I know that Jesus was born of a virgin. And so there are things that God undoes in a very similar way that things were done badly. Anyway, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. It's rather interesting that God places a limit here and it's, a, it's kind of a stopwatch, you know, tick, 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 120 years. Well, there are two theories about that as well. And the more you read, the more opinions you find. You get three rabbis, you get five opinions. The question is, is he referring to a lifetime, meaning human beings will not live anything more than 120 years. They will not strive with, uh, they will not be alive for, for longer than that. Or is he setting a deadline? It's very interesting that this deadline coincides very, very well with when the flood comes 120 years later. I believe God is saying, you got 120 years to straighten out your act, guys. And it's interesting because no one outside families, the family of Noah did. So if Noah was a missionary being supported by us, we'd think, you know, you're doing a pretty garbage job there, bro. <laughs> because how many people got saved just as family? So, I believe it's timeline. You've got 120 years to get this boat built, which is a good period of time, but it's a big boat. 750 feet long and 75 feet wide. It's, it's a big giant boat. There were giants in the earth in those days. And afterward, and also afterward, I want you to note that the scripture says that. 
There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward. Well, the sons of God came to the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. You've got these fallen angels that come and produce children. So it's not just they've come down to have fun and have one night stands. They're actually trying to proliferate the earth with this strange offspring. It says that there were giants on the earth in those days and also after. So we're kind of given a place marker into the future. Remember what was said here in Genesis chapter six. It says that there were giants and the word there in the original Hebrew is Nephilim, which means one who, ones who fall. I think that they are fallen angels who have come to contaminate the human race to prevent the coming of the Messiah. You can find Egyptian, Roman, Greek, all these demigods, which I believe that there is some root in fact that there were mighty men of old. And the scripture says that they were men of renown. So the people that knew about these folks who were this cross breed, my question is, what do you do with somebody who's born of a human mother and an angelic father? What sort of soul do they have? And could that be why the earth got as bad as it did at this time? And then what does God do with such a soul? Is there a possibility that they can repent because they're part human? Or is there no possibility for them to repent because they're angelic? These are questions I sit up at night and think about for two seconds before I go to sleep. <laughs> so you want to you think about it, you may. In Numbers 13, 33, it says there, there we saw giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants and we were all like grasshoppers in our own sight so that, that we were in their sight. If you remember, there were 12 spies that were sent into the promised land with Joshua and they went and they saw all of the land and they said, the land is good. In fact, they carried a whole bunch of grapes back with them. It's the uh, universal sign of tourism actually for Israel's two guys carrying giant grapes. But anyway, there were only two that had a good report. That was Joshua and Caleb. And they said, forget all that. The Lord said, we're taking it, we're taking it. Those guys actually survived. The other 10 and all the people that believed them and said, no, we can't go in. There's giants in the, giants in the land. Where'd they come from? They come from the scripture which says, on the earth in those days and also afterward. Just because the flood r ruined everything and m marked them out doesn't mean that they couldn't do it again. Just so that you know. And so there's an explanation as to why some people were to be annihilated. You remember when they went into the promised land, God said certain cities and certain people, don't let one of them get away. Not male, not female, not children, not animals, everything. Take them all out. And we, as, as being grown up as a Christian, we go, oh my goodness, you know, I, I understand a just war theory and all that kind of thing and going in and getting an objective, but why destroy everyone? This give you a good explanation as to why? Because genetically they've been fiddled with by the devil and because what's going to happen is if you, if you let that go on, in which they did, by the way, they have greater problems later. In fact, if you remember with David, he goes up against Goliath, who's this massive guy. We're given all of his statistics like you should have a baseball card on him and how big his spear was and uh, how, how much his shield weighed and how tall he was. And nobody wanted to fight him because they knew it was a losing battle. Not to mention he was trained to fight. He was a giant. And so David goes over and he gathers five smooth stones from the brook and he goes up against him, this little kid. But the thing is, God anointed him. He may not have been qualified as a soldier, but he was anointed by God to do that very thing. So don't worry if God's called you to something, he'll give you the power to be able to do it. So he grabs these five smooth stones and he takes out Goliath. And, and the reason he had five smooth stones is not in case he missed, it's because Goliath had four brothers. You look in the scriptures a little bit further and you see his mighty men are the ones who took them down. 
And so they become giant killers. That's actually their name. So when they would, you know, hang, that would be their, their you know, giant killers on their back. And they were wearing their colors. And then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. Is there any doubt <laughs> that they were messed up? And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. It reminds me of when Jesus wept. There are two occasions when Jesus weeps off the top of my head. One is the death of Lazarus. He goes in and he tries to share who he is and what he's there for and he tries to let them know, hey, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. Do you believe that? He, he asks of Mary. She says, yes, Lord. We know that in the kingdom he'll be there. And Jesus is trying to tell them what he's about to do and they're not getting it. And Jesus began to weep. He was weeping at the hard-heartedness of the people who weren't getting what he was trying to say. In Matthew 23, 37, as he's coming into Jerusalem for the last time, coming over the hill, riding on the back of a donkey, he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Here again, Jesus weeping over the sinfulness of humankind, that judgment is going to come because people just don't listen. The depth of mankind's depravity demands justice, but it is reluctantly executed by a loving creator. You get the idea that this is not what God wants to do, but he has to, because in addition to being loving, God is also just. And if he were not just, he would not be loving. It's like forgiving everyone else's student debt except for the one that I had to pay. <laughs> See, that's not very loving because it's not very just. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have overshared. That's all right. Brace yourselves. I may do it again. And we know in John 11, when he comes to the death of his friend Lazarus, whom he loved, he wept there as well. All of these it was God being frustrated with the sinfulness of human beings and their inability to turn and the judgment that was coming. And so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I made them. It's an interesting thing when you hear God say he's sorry. You think, well, God made an error in making human beings. You and I, when we say we're sorry, it's because we made an error. When God says he's sorry, he just means he's grieved in his heart about something. He's brokenhearted. It doesn't mean that he's going to repent. The old King James is so good at misleading people into that. God is going to repent of making man, and that's what it says in the original King James. When we repent, we do a 180 from sin, and we turn around, and that's not what God does. But he is sorrowful that he makes man because of the sinfulness that was on the earth. In Ephesians 4, 29, 30, it says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. So the reason you say something to somebody is because they need to hear it, not because you need to say it. Amen. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Hey, I got to say. No, you don't. You don't have to say anything. No, no, I got to say it. No, I don't think you do. that it may impart grace to the hearers. That's the most important thing as to why I would say anything. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. In the New Testament, we're told not to grieve the Spirit of God, which is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. In other words, when I drag myself and I make a bad decision, I drag the Holy Spirit of God with me. By the way, you can't grieve an it. You can't grieve an impersonal spirit. You can only grieve a personality. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's the third person of the Trinity, doubtless. And he's all over what's happening here in Genesis. And we see him before 
as he was hovering over the earth and God created the earth with the spirit of God. So this is the Holy Spirit of God. We're not to grieve. And yeah, it, I hope that God doesn't say, I'm so sorry I made Dave. Big mistake. I repent. I've been so patient with him. That's not what it is. But we can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And I don't want to do that. And feel, the thing is that we're together and I feel it. You, you feel that? When you know that you've done something wrong or you said something you shouldn't have or you've done damage with your mouth or uh, you've neglected something you should have done, I, it, it hurts. I remember the first time I hurt. <laughs> it's when the Lord began to speak to my heart before I had no conscience. You're lucky to get a semi-finished product up here. <laughs> but Noah, here's one of the beautiful buts in the Bible. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect. Wow. In his generations, Noah walked with God. Noah was perfect? Well, wait a minute, pastor. The scripture says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How can this guy be perfect? Well, notice what says is perfect about him. He was perfect in his generations. What does that mean? If every intent of, uh, of the thoughts of a man are evil continually, he's the best of what they have. But I want to show you something. This is the first time that grace is mentioned in the Bible. The very first time. Noah found grace. You know what grace is? God's unmerited favor. You see, Noah was a just man because he found grace. He wasn't just enough to, and God say, all right, you're good enough. I'll, I'll, I'll put grace on you. It, it was the other way around. Because he found grace in the eyes of God, he was a just man. A lot of us think we need to work ourselves up to the place where God loves us. And that's not how it works. It's when God shows you grace, you can't help but to do the things that please the Father. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what grace spells out. God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. You guys all heard that before. Okay. It says that he was perfect genetically. He was perfect in his generations. In other words, he wasn't messed up with all this fallen angel jazz. It's not that he was perfect, but he was not mixed. Genetically, he was a thoroughbred. He was an AKC, you know. You guys know what that means. He was not messed up with all the fallen angel stuff. That's what it means that he was perfect in his generations. His DNA was not contaminated with any of that angelic mess that Satan was trying to do to contaminate the human gene pool. And it says that he walked with God. And it's interesting that this is always said. Now, walking with God means trusting in God, having faith in God according to what he says. And it means, and, it, and a walk is interesting because it's always a step at a time, right? It's not like I'm taking a drive. I'm going to take a drive with God. No, you take a walk with God because it involves a step and a step and a step and a step and maybe an adjustment. It's a walk with God. It's a daily, moment by moment, Lord, what would you have me do? And Noah walked with God. It's interesting. There was one other person who walked with God just recently, and it was Enoch. Enoch wa walked with God, and he was no more, just like that slide. It was completely unplanned. Romans 4.3 says, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accredited to him for righteousness. You see, this faith is actually what brings us before God, and it's not something that we can do without God being in our lives. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, bipartisan teamwork. In Hebrews eleven seven, 7, it says, by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of the things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. If you remember in Hebrews 11, it's this chapter of faith, all of these men who have walked before us and women like Rahab, who have 
exhibited faith in trusting God at his word, even though everything around them was against it. He shows faith. Number one, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is not a, I hope so. You know, it's not like maybe. Faith is evidence. If onlookers were to judge whether you were a Christian or not, would there be enough evidence that you were? If you were brought up in court on charges of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence besides what you might say to prove that you are? Because evidence is what faith is. It's substance and evidence. Noah, being warned, did something about it. And it was because of God's grace. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Noah didn't work himself up to a place where God approved of him. God approved of him, and it caused him to rise to that place. Isn't it the same for you? Because of God's grace in my life, I am what I am. That's what Paul says. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. We can't pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, well, God found me worthy. No, he found me. <laughs> Spit on me and, you know, washed me off and set me up here for you people. So sorry. James chapter 2, verse 14 says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says they have faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Can such a faith that has no works, that has no response, save him? What did Noah do? By faith, being divinely warned of things not seen, he moved with godly fear. He prepared an ark. Faith is evidence. It's substance. It does something. It's not just... Yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to church on Sunday. Watch my watch about 10 times. But they got food there, which is good. <laughs> that is not faith. Faith is when you have to step out and do something which you have absolutely no proof you're going to get anything back from it. And it's something you know that God would have you do. And so you do it. And even when it looks bleak after you've done it, you say, listen, I'm going to do it because I believe the Lord would have me do it. And you stay your course. And Noah stayed the course for 120 years. That's why he's in the hall of faith. Did you know that your witness is condemnation to those who see it? It says here that he prepared an ark saving his household by which he condemned the world and became heir to the righteousness which is according to faith. Do you know, you're not supposed to just go and witness, you're supposed to be a witness. Mm -hmm. Being a witness is your lifestyle. It's everything you do. It's everything you say. It's everywhere you go. It's how you spend your money, how you spend your time. That's what it is to be a witness. Noah was a witness, but my goodness, his ministry didn't do so well because it was only his family he took out of there, right? Mm -hmm. But his witness was to condemn all of them because they heard, they knew, they were warned. Enoch previously was a preacher of righteousness. It's a pretty good family tree he's in. And did you know that your witness is confirmation of your salvation? Do you know the very fact that you follow the, a different drummer, the evidence of that in your life, and the decisions you make and how you say, that is a confirmation that you don't do everything you feel like doing. That's confirmation that you're a Christian. Do you see that? Listen, I'm not the same guy I used to be. So if, if I can look back and I look, I look now, I'm not the same guy. Sometimes I just look at all my flaws and faults and shortcomings and weaknesses and how I say stupid things and, you know, I forget things and I waste time sometimes. Yes, I do. And I think about that and I don't know if you've ever had a time when you wonder, hey, am I really yours, Lord? Because I'm not feeling, I'm not feeling it. That's the problem with our feelings. They're a wonderful caboose, but they're a terrible engine. <laughs> you can't be led by your feelings or you'll always be disappointed. It's like trying to live for happiness. It's like eating cotton candy 24 seven, forget it. You'll be dead. Our witness and the way we behave for Christ 
living according to the rules and the things that are not seen. That is evidence that God is inside of us. So take heart, any of you who might be under condemnation. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I don't know I'd name my son Ham. <laughs> Genoa ham, spiced ham, I don't know, ham. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And so God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. It's interesting, the very earth in which mankind was created would be the thing that God would use for judgment upon mankind. He says he had three sons. I, I guess I was brought up on TV, kind of mainlining TV. I don't know, do you got... You guys remember that with the tapping foot? I'm sorry. I, I ask you to enter into the psychoticness of my mind. When I say, he begot three sons, I, I just, sorry. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You know, it sounds a lot like today, doesn't it? The earth was corrupt. And all the flesh was corrupted on the earth. I think about the violence. You'll notice violence mentioned several times in this section. Violence of our society. I think back to 9-11. Never thought that airplanes could be used as a weapon. I think about the violence that we have going on with the death of George Floyd, with the announcement that Roe v. Wade is overturned, the violence that it produces in people. We are not far from where these folks were. And I believe the Lord is gonna come back again very soon. I think about the violence that starts like in January after a meeting in front of the White House and how people were so enraged and motivated to violence because of injustice or whatever it is, it's violence. That's not the way to be able to change things. And if our hope is in anything that happens in the White House, we are sadly mistaken. It is gonna come from the Lord Jesus Christ alone. There is no one on this earth that's a savior. I think about the school shootings, the one in Texas where 21 kids were killed. I think of the violence that has struck this earth. I wonder if God looks and if he's sorry he created man and if he rolls up his sleeves and is ready to call out judgment again. But I hope like Enoch that you and I will not be here. That's a picture of I believe the rapture. And so that is the interlude into what we're going to get into in chapter 6 as we look at everything that is happening with Noah. We're going to look at all the details, the size of the ship, why God says it has to be a certain size, and try to give you an understanding of the scope and what God does and how he opens up the waters of the deep and how the waters above the earth collapse and how the world is entirely flooded. There's some interesting geographical things that happen here. There are some interesting prehistoric issues that occur. The finding of fossils is a miracle, by the way, because you have to have very specific things in place. They have to die immediately. They get all put in a stack because there was water. Have you, any of you ever seen a petrified forest? Petrified forest is a bunch of trees that are made out of stone that once were trees. The funny thing is you find them in the desert. Those trees came from miles and miles away. How do you get a tree miles and miles away? So we're gonna talk about some of those things. So hold tight. Mm -hmm.